Welcome to the GRASP seminar research overview, the first day out of two. So we'll have uh, eight speakers today. Um, we are doing things hybrid. So we will, um, we're both doing Zoom and presenting here. Uh, hopefully it'll be smooth. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, because of the complications, especially with swapping between eight speakers, um, we may uh, run into a couple issues, but we'll see how it goes. So um, just a quick overview for those of you who are new to GRASP. Uh, we are about 20 uh, primary faculty and then another um, 15 or 20 affiliated faculty. Uh, we're doing all kinds of stuff. Um, GRASP is the oldest uh, research ro robotics lab in the country. Um, and uh, recently, we are also ranked number one on the uh, uh, csrankings.org site for robotics, which is uh, number one in the world, which is kind of a nice little thing. So we have eight speakers today that are gonna talk very quickly through their um, research. So just as a reminder to the faculty, um, we have roughly 10 minutes. So ideally, if you could have your presentation in eight minutes, Maybe we'll have a chance for one question. We'll probably not. At nine minutes, uh, at eight minutes, I'm going to stand up uh, just to let you know that eight minutes is up. I'll have an alarm that goes off at nine minutes. So that'll give us one minute to swap. If you're still talking, I'll start waving my arms. <laughs> Hopefully, you'll, we won't go too far over. So I'm going to try to be a little bit strict on time. Um, uh, so this is the list of the eight speakers at Noon will probably finish and then there'll be pizza out in the back. Um, just also as a reminder to the faculty, uh, just go through Zoom share screen. You don't need to hook up your uh, HDMI. Okay, so let's jump into things. I'll try to do my, I'm gonna go first, a quick overview of uh, my lab. In my lab, we do uh, soft robotics a little bit, uh, trust robots, we have flying swarms and we've also got robots made of ice and sticks. Those are the ones that I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, this is a trust robot. And uh, let me just get rid of this. Uh, we have, I have a postdoc. How do I, oops, let me get rid of that. Um, get that, uh, oh, Ah, sorry. Okay. 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 So um, we have a uh, uh, trust robots, robots that are made out of trusses. Each one of the members of the trust can change their length. Uh, Zhang Ho, Andrew Bay is a postdoc among. Uh, many others that are working on this project. The basic idea is that you have a robot that could theoretically do search and rescue. If there's a damaged building, it can reconfigure itself, reconfigure the topology and do things like hold up the building. Um, one of the things that, oh shoot, John Ho is working on is also uh, path planning. So um, using a probabilistic robot planner, one of the nice things about having a robot that has elements in its length that can change the length. You can also change the size. So you could theoretically become really small to get through small gaps, things like that, which may make um, planning a bit easier. Uh, Alexander is a PhD student working on um, motion planning and reconfiguration of these types of systems. It's a lot of very high dimension because there are a lot of members that have degrees of freedom. So understanding how to make them move, understanding how to do the reconfiguration is very computationally intensive and he's come up with um, some topo topological analysis methods using knot theory to see whether um, you need to reconfigure or not or just relabeling work. We also have uh, the second version we call VTP2, which is focusing more on the reconfiguration of the nodes, um, uh, which is the new structure we're thinking about using these steel spheres with magnets um, underneath in order to uh, facilitate that type of reconfiguration. 
Gedalia Kniznik is another PhD student. He's working on a um, what we call mod boats. So these are very simple uh, boats with one motor. And the way it works is this is an underside view. Um, it just goes back and forth in their little paddles that kind of swing out as it goes back and forth. And by changing how you um, do that oscillation, you can get it to move forward or turn. And so with this method, I mean, with this device, how to, controlling uh, the, the position and um, orientation is, is a little bit tricky, but he's figured out how to do that. We're also doing it in groups more recently. Um, we're also thinking these robots can dock together to form larger formations. Uh, if we have a system where you are in a, a, a place where there are currents, um, sorry about the choppiness of this video. For example, in this case, there's a gyre. The, the fluid is circling around. Um, the robots know that if they are on the outer side of the gyre, it moves faster than the inside. So it can use that fact to um, be very energy, uh, save a lot of energy by going into the higher velocity if it needs to catch up the higher velocity part of the stream and then, uh, then dock with the robot without using a lot of energy. Uh, Walker is working on a project with um, micro robots. So this is the micro robots that Mark Nipkin uh, is developing. I think he's gonna give it a presentation next week in day two. Um, so these are robots that are 100 micron in length. Uh, they actually walk in liquid. So one of the things we're looking at is can we have a swarm of them and do things like construct uh, uh, lattices. Um, so this is with Jordan Rainey in mechanical engineering. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is can we do things like biologically inspired structures like bamboo, which has to be, which is very resilient. It can take damage and still have good um, strength and resilience. So we're trying to see if we can do something like that using local rules. We're also analyzing uh, how this thing actually moves in liquid. Um, it doesn't swim, it actually walks. And so on a micro scale, using things like lubrication theory is how we think the forces are enabling this thing to walk, which is actually not exactly clear how that works. Walker is also working with Vijay Kumar and some of his students on um, swarm coverage. So this is just how do you get swarms to do different tasks in this particular case. We have um, an area that you might want to have the robots go to. These are what we call the importance density function, the, the shaded regions. Um, and uh, he's using Lloyd's algorithm is a, is a classic one to do this. He's been using graph neural networks um, to do a much better job uh, at um, doing this coverage. So in the animation, the red dots are the graph neural network algorithm robots. The ones in black are Lloyd's algorithm, which don't do quite as well in terms of reaching the importance density uh, areas. Another swarm robot project we have is with flying swarms. So this is Spencer Folk is working on this among with others. We have the world's record for the smallest flying robot. This is um, not the smallest one. This is a little bit bigger than, it's the same function, but we've uh, scaled it up a slight amount. We're working with Mike Rubenstein at Northwestern. Uh, we have a contract with uh, NSF to build 200 of these. And we wanna see if we can get them to have formations um, and a swarm that a person could kind of shape with their hand. Because they're so small, they're safe. If they bump into you, they won't hurt you. Um, one of the interesting things is how do we do planning for these vehicles in that swarm? Um, when we have that shape, we, we actually can't have them be static. They actually have to move um, in a path. So we create a Hamiltonian path that, that approximates that shape, like a sphere or a square or whatever shape you might want. And then the robots move through that. And so coming up with this path autonomously is, is a little bit tricky. Also, because the vehicles have a wake, there's an inflow of air if another vehicle flies underneath that vehicle, they may, um, you know, it'll disturb and they may crash. So uh, how do you avoid that wake? Or we're also looking at, can we devise, can we create the, these vehicles which have a different shape wake? So it's easier to plan for moving around in that area. Devin Carroll is working on um, what we call IceBot and StickBot. These are robots that are built with found materials. So say you have a project where you need to go to the moon or Antarctica or someplace where there's lots of ice, it might be nice to, instead of shipping up a whole robot, you just ship parts of the robot and the robot uses the materials around it to build itself. Or if it gets damaged, it can repair itself and that kind of thing. So this one on the left is the is our first looking at ice spot. 
the things that we're analyzing from a research point of view is how much energy does it take to cut out the shapes that are required? What types of things would you need? How do you minimize the um, mechanisms to be able to build this robot? He's also looking at um, uh, another found material, which is sticks. In, and we're working with Michelle Johnson on this. Uh, if, if you have a situation where you have to build a robot and you don't have uh, lots of resources. So in, in Africa, they don't have that many 3D printers. It's not easy to build things. If you need to build something that you can adapt to people like in for rehabilitation that you need to customize, can you do it with sticks or other things? And so how would you do the, um, how would you do that? How can you analyze the stiffness and other performance properties that are important? Um, quickly, I think I'm running out of time. So um, another project that actually finished a while ago, um, but I think uh, we are, I'm thinking about reviving uh, is um, what's called s'mores. These are modular reconfigurable robots that can move around and attach together and form different shapes. Um, and so how do you, what are the algorithms that will let you do form different shapes? What shapes should you form? How do you achieve tasks are some of the things that we're looking at. Uh, just real quickly, um, Jessica Yin is working on uh, a soft robot. This is actually a sensor that's combined uh, distance sensing and tactile sensing with a soft membrane. Greg Campbell's also working on um, soft robot using stretchable and non-stretchable materials. Um, in this case, this is with clutches. How can you, can you have a clutch that changes the shape uh, of the material as you go? Okay, I don't think I have time for questions. So next up is critique. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do uh, in my research group. Uh, it's called LIRIL for short. Uh, so we work on three main things. Uh, the first thing that I work on is understanding neural networks. Neural networks are complicated machine learning models which uh, have become very good over the last decade. But there's a lot of things that we don't understand about them. Why do they work? Why do they break? How do we fix them when they break? And somehow like uh, they go against a lot of stuff that we have accepted over the last uh, 200 years of statistics even. You know that if, you, if I give you 10 data points, you should not be fitting a polynomial of 20th degree to it. You will overfit. In deep learning, we don't seem to overfit. And these are the kind of questions that we are interested in answering. Uh, this is a, 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 a continuation of some of my PhD work, which was more about understanding what kind of functions neural networks express or how easy it is to train these models. Can we come up with better algorithms to train these models, et cetera. Okay. Uh, these days uh, we are interested in uh, understanding a little more about why neural networks do not overfit. Uh, and there is some way of looking at these questions. Uh, uh, we primarily use tools from statistical physics and information theory to understand these questions. And roughly speaking, it comes down to saying that I have a neural network with let's say 1 million parameters. What are all kinds of functions that can be expressed by these parameters? We know that there are many parameters, so presumably they should be expressing many, many functions, but the kind of data that you fit these networks typically on, images, text, uh, sounds, et cetera, there is some regularities in this data sets, right? It, it doesn't take a lot of, uh, uh, effort to take an image of a cat and then call it a cat. You and I can do it with a few features. We look at the nose, uh, uh, ears, etc. So there is some uh, mathematical formalization of how simple typical learning tasks are. If typical learning tasks are quite simple, then even if you fit a very complicated model to it, you will not overfit. Uh, another way of thinking about this is that if I give you data that comes from a quadratic polynomial, no matter what you fit to it, you will not overfit too much, even if you fit a 100 degree polynomial. So roughly speaking, this is the kind of theory that we are trying to build. Uh, mathematically, it comes from this field called information geometry. And uh, it tells you a little bit about what is the uh, geometry on the space of probability distributions. If you know this geometry a little bit better, you can understand when you overfit, when you do not overfit, et cetera. Okay. Um, there is some uh, very cool applications uh, or uh, um, uh, future directions of this work that I am excited about and they pertain to biological learning. You know, like uh, classifying cats and dogs is easy, uh, presumably for us humans. Neural networks also find it easy. 
So we should be able to find some common principles that allow both biological learning to solve such tasks and also allow artificial neural networks to solve the same task. The, the mathematics that un, helps us understand these problems should be shared. Uh, so we are trying to find such kinds of principles. And uh, here is one cool way to think about it. So this is an experiment that was run by uh, Josh Gold, who is a professor in neuroscience. Uh, suppose uh, you saw that an apple fell down from a tree. You can have two possible explanations for this phenomenon. One is gravity. Uh, the second one is that there is a ghost and then he took this apple from the tree and magically put it down on the ground. These are two hypotheses. One of them you and I know is a little absurd, but it does explain the evidence, right? It is a very complicated explanation in the sense that if you saw the apple lying on something else, then you would have to uh, explain the actions of the ghost in many different ways. So the ghost can do many, many different things. It's a very complicated model, whereas gravity is a simple model. You and I, we choose to believe in gravity instead of choosing to believe in ghosts, right? So conceptually or mathematically, the kind of things that the ghost can do is a very complicated manifold of models. The kind of things that gravity can do is a simple manifold of models. And when you see some observations, this star, what you're really trying to do is project the star on the manifold of models and say, aha, this is my model for why this apple fell down. There are many, many possible projections on complicated models, and that is why you don't like the complicated models. So we can do experiments with humans, and we can identify these biases. So these are real experiments where we give, so we have designed such tasks, not the one with the ghost, of course, but slightly more complicated ones. And we can check when people are biased towards simple models, people are biased towards more complicated models, some people uh, uh, do not have such bias because they think in very simple terms and we can identify such things. Yeah. The second thing that I work on is uh, understanding the space of learning tasks. I said that if the learning task is simple, then neural networks do not overfit or should not overfit. Well, not all tasks are simple. Some are presumably complicated. Distinguishing between uh, Beethoven playing piano and I playing piano is very easy. But this distinction between Beethoven playing piano and one of you people who is good at playing piano is not that easy, right? So we would like to characterize principles that makes, make tasks difficult. We would like to characterize principles that make tasks easy. Find which tasks are similar to which other tasks. Uh, if you have RGB images, then they are presumably closer to other kinds of RGB images. Even if you don't see the, uh, the relationship within the categories of these tasks, but MRI images might be quite different from this, okay? So this is about understanding what kind of tasks are easy, what, what are hard, what are relationships between them that help us eventually reduce the amount of data that you need to train machine learning models. So this is the central question and application of this kind of thinking. If you know something about the space of tasks, then I would like to build new methods to do machine learning with very few samples. And Mathematically or, or conceptually, the key question is, I have some data, whether it is labeled, unlabeled, whether it is from some other task, from the same task that you're trying to solve, doesn't really matter so much, right? What I'm interested in understanding is, what is the optimal way to learn from this kind of data, okay? Um, there's a lot of algorithmic work that we do around this. And so some of you might recognize these names, uh, transfer learning, few short learning, continual learning, semi supervising These are all different ways of reducing the amount of data that you need to train machine learning models. Yeah. Uh, there are some applications uh, uh, with, uh, that we are pursuing with folks in the med school. Uh, this pertains to MRI data uh, for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease or understanding how it progresses. Your brain basically shrinks in time as you grow. It shrinks a little bit faster if you have dementia and if you can understand how quickly it is shrinking, then you know uh, how far along dementia you are. Yeah. Uh, I am a roboticist by my upbringing, so I spent a lot of time building autonomous cars uh, when I was your age. Uh, these days, we are a little more interested in understanding unstructured terrains, forests. Uh, how do we uh, look at a forest with a team of drones, create a map of everything that is in there, how many trees there are, how they branch out, at what height they typically branch, how fat the bark is, whether there's disease on the leaves or not. Uh, turns out uh, forestry people have basically never bothered to measure the shrubs in the forest. If you ask them how many trees there are, they will boom, give you an answer. If you ask them what is the volume of the shrubs in the forest, which is also presumably capturing enough carbon, 
they will not uh, they haven't bothered to measure it so we are using these kinds of uh, systems to uh, create a more detailed catalog of natural environments we also have some projects around multi agent control and competitive and end games uh, that i can talk sometime later if you are interested uh, but uh, this is a fairly large group uh, in addition to the phd students whose pictures you saw on the slides we also have master students uh, who are working on some of these projects uh, there were a number of undergraduate students who worked during the summer on some of them. They were all like uh, kind of taking their baby steps into research problems. And I kind of uh, ran out of time while creating this slide. So I couldn't pull up pictures for all of them. So this is all, uh, this is how they all look. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Uh, reach out to us if you are interested in learning more. Thank you. All right, hi, I'm Kostas Danilidis. <clears throat> so my group uh, works uh, on, uh, uh, on the intersection of uh, uh, geometric vision and uh, uh, deep learning. I have been uh, working on uh, inverse problems in uh, geometry for uh, more than 30 years, 25 years of them uh, using uh, only mathematical formula. And in the last five years, we, uh, try to use also priors in this so uh, that uh, we establish through uh, machine learning uh, techniques through which uh, we can not only uh, perceive the world but sometimes also we can uh, hallucinate the world so uh, there are three main areas that my group uh, focuses on uh, it is uh, euromorphic representations uh, invariance and recovery of 3D in many problems and uh, uh, robot navigation with emphasis on uh, uh, semantics, not just metric representations. So for uh, every 30 milliseconds, a racing pedestrian can uh, walk for uh, 30 centimeters. A Formula One car moves three meters, a rifle bullet uh, <coughs> flies 30 meters, but uh, any camera you use these days, even on the most expensive uh, iPhone, uh, can capture only one frame, which in case of uh, motion uh, will be blurry. And uh, that also consumes quite a lot of power as a camera. But uh, biological eyes uh, can do that uh, in a fraction of this power. Uh, a bee can uh, land by using uh, less than one microwatt. And uh, now, as uh, finally uh, engineers have realized that uh, uh, these cameras have not been built for robotics, the ones that we have been using on our cell phones, uh, but uh, they have been used for photography and video and for robotics and for uh, uh, enable a closure of the perception and action loop. Uh, we need something that uh, uh, is faster, uh, captures the world in a continuous way, and avoids uh, like illumination artifacts and also it is in low power. What else? Um, all right, this is an example of the input you get uh, from one of these uh, neuromorphic cameras that now even uh, Sony is uh, producing, which is producing 80% of the cameras in the world, of the chips for the cameras in the world. And uh, we see that uh, even with uh, just perceiving the changes in pixels, you have a pretty good idea what is going on in the scene, uh, the fraction of the bandwidth and power. So we thought uh, that uh, this would be possible only just for motion tasks, like what uh, like insects do and birds. But uh, if uh, we are present uh, something, uh, just the silhouette of an object, if we can detect the silhouette, like on the picture on the left, we can actually even produce a full three-dimensional model of the object by moving one of these neuromorphic cameras around by just exploiting the fact, uh, uh, the biological fact that most of the information of the shape of an object uh, lies really on the silhouette of an object, which creates most of these uh, events in a neuromorphic system. This is an example how <coughs> good this, uh, cameras and our algorithm is, this was a finalist paper on computing optical flow in the dark. This is with uh, the lights off and uh, at speeds uh, of a fidget spinner. 
So this, uh, 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 I mean, all this uh, work uh, started with uh, really looking at neuroscience. And uh, if one looks also on neuroscience, one will realize that uh, uh, there is a quite big uh, spectrum of transformations in the, ob in, the uh, uh, in the brain that uh, we are uh, either invariant or equivariant, which means that uh, our uh, neurons are tuned to specific uh, actually views. And uh, this has been proven uh, in experiments with monkeys, but it's not true with the classical convolutional neural networks. Whereas you see when I rotate a picture and I run it through the classical convolution, the window inside the picture here is uh, really changing. So it is not uh, really invariant and is not also uh, rotated the right way. A truly equivariant network like the ones uh, we have built, if the object is uh, really uh, rotating in the world, then uh, all the feature layers are rotating accordingly. And in this sense, not only you can predict the rotation of the object, but you can also uh, produce an invariant descriptor on the right, uh, which you can do by average or max uh, pooling. Uh, extending this to more complicated scenes, uh, if we have trained the system on perceiving single objects, uh, then we can perceive and reconstruct uh, uh, this uh, object in any orientation. So if we have a very sparse representation from depth views, like the ones uh, in this uh, scene here, then we can reconstruct uh, full surfaces like meshes of the objects, uh, even if they are in arbitrary orientation by not having been trained on the scene, but only on individual objects. Uh, other systems which have been trained uh, with not in an equivariant way, produce uh, results like the ones on the bottom. Uh, we have uh, applied it also in more complicated scenes, like uh, the, this huge apartment reconstructions from the Matterport data set. And we really uh, see that uh, without any segmentation information, that uh, every object uh, is really reconstructed and also in the right orientation with respect to the environment. Uh, we generalize this to more deformable surfaces, not transformations on 3D, where we study out of a very sparse uh, input of very sparse point clouds, how can we <coughs> really reconstruct the whole surface and also uh, compute the three-dimensional flow of the environment. Uh, the key in this technique uh, is something we call uh, neural uh, <coughs> homeomorphism, which is really neural networks which are invertible and uh, can, in this sense, uh, go between uh, uh, input uh, and shape and next the frame in uh, an invertible and continuous way. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work on the fundamental problems of uh, reconstructed humans. Uh, this is a system uh, where uh, we have also showed that ICRA in uh, real time, uh, where uh, we can estimate the joints and the full surface of the object. And we have also worked uh, with uh, neuroscientists on capturing the pose of the bird and the way they really take a posture when they listen to male uh, songs. And uh, this is our uh, aviary uh, neck uh, very close to the penovation centers where at the end, uh, uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Mark Schmidt and uh, Vijay Balasubramanian who works also with uh, Pratik, uh, will be able to have a full picture of the behavior of the birds over uh, like uh, 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 seven, like uh, 24 hours, seven days, and the whole year. Uh, finally, uh, we believe that uh, uh, for many problems in robotics, uh, both for reconstructing metrically, but also reconstructing semantically so that you can follow, for example, directions in natural language like the one you see here on the, in the middle. We believe that what really matters most is to build the right maps. So we have an active uh, learning system for really building maps and even hallucinating what is behind the walls by using prior statistics from distributions of uh, apartments and uh, where like furniture lies in this apartment, 
and uh, we try to solve this problem. This is one of the difficult, uh, quite uh, uh, unsolved problems in robotics. Like the baseline is really like 50% uh, of the time can you achieve, can we really follow these uh, instructions? Uh, I think I'm finishing here. Uh, we have a, a, a really like a, this is a, my students as well as uh, their partners and uh, children, and uh, we are very proud uh, of uh, our like really uh, diverse group of uh, researchers. Uh, and um, yeah, please uh, let me know if uh, you are interested in this research. All right, hi everyone. I'm Eric. Uh, I direct the Lifelong Machine Learning Research Group within GRASP. And I want to start off by, imagine that we have a robot in an environment like a university. And in this case, it's tasked with learning to recognize a whole bunch of objects. And then like staplers, books, monitors, and other things you like find. We can obviously teach it new things like plants. Then we might take the same robot and move it to a completely different environment. Things like, like a hospital, for example, where you encounter things like wheelchairs and walkers and beds. And then we move it to another environment and another and another. And the idea behind the work that my group does is that instead of just learning a model and then applying that model, then forgetting that model, like you do in conventional machine learning, instead, we should have a system that learns much more like you or I. It just continually builds upon its knowledge over time. As it gets more experiences, it improves performance. It's versatile. I'm not interested in techniques that work just on one set of tasks. I'm interested in very broad sets of tasks. And I'm going to try to convince you that lifelong learning, enabling the agent to build upon its knowledge over time is a way uh, to accomplish this. So what we're really interested in is intelligent systems that quickly learn new tasks, build upon their previous experience, exhibit versatility, and can also do this just like you or I do by learning from each other and by interacting with the environment, by interacting with other agents. And we do this primarily by enabling transfer between the different tasks. And so my group works on three main research topics here. First is general lifelong learning are also called continual learning, where in this case, we have developed techniques like deep reinforcement learning algorithms that learn continually or deep uh, uh, compositional representations that allow us to create modular knowledge that is very reusable cross tasks. We're also interested in learning in non-stationary environments. So the world changes all the time. So how can we capture that notion within the learning algorithm and exploit it? We're also interested in learning in open worlds. Instead of these very constrained, narrow data sets, what happens if we actually take a robot, put it in the real world, where the set of problems it might encounter are unconstrained? That's a very challenging situation for today's techniques. As part of this, much like you or I do, we're also interested in algorithms that choose themselves what to learn on. So we call this self-directed learning or self-taught learning. So how can we take this notion to have the system itself explore, figure out what to learn, figure out what's important, et cetera. And we apply these to two different sets of applications. The first and most interesting to this group is service robotics. And so I'll show you some videos of that later. We also have a bunch of applications to precision medicine, which I'll also talk about. So just to show you what this might look like, imagine we have a task, in this case, it's a computer vision task. And we're learning a bunch of different tasks over time. So in this case, performance goes up. Then as soon as you encounter a new task, the performance drops down. And over here on this side, what you're seeing is kind of a conventional multitask convolutional neural network. In contrast, we have a lifelong learner that builds on performance over time. So notice that as it learns subsequent tasks, first off, it's able to retain performance. It doesn't experience this catastrophic drop off like existing methods, but it's also able to build on its performance over time by sharing information among these different tasks. And so that's really kind of the notion that we're interested in capturing here in the algorithms that we have. And so if we take this and apply this to a robot operating in an environment, you might see that initially we start off with very simple things like go to a particular position. And then over time, it learns increasingly complex tasks, things like how to use a hammer, how to operate a door latch, all the way up to how to use a coffee maker while ha simultaneously having to slide the mug underneath the spout while pressing the button. And it's able to reuse knowledge across all these sets of tasks. Um, the most recent thing my group has been focused on is this idea of how do you take this 
idea of learning continually over time and instead build really modular reusable chunks of knowledge. And we're doing this through what we're calling composable representations that go all the way from perception all the way through action. So in ROS, if we're conventionally designing a robot pipeline, we have a set of sensors over here and then we have some actuators like an arm we wanna do. And what we do is we have sensing modules that we might put in place then based on what the sensors perceive, they choose to plan. And then finally they convert that plan into a set of motor commands that are actually executed on the robot, right? And so if we have three different robots, each with their own sensors and actuators, we have to kind of custom build our own pipeline in order to make this work. We can obviously take each of these and, in, and combine them together in different ways. So instead of working with standard ROS modules, we can work with neural networks that do the same idea. And so the question is, can we learn modular or composable reusable networks for each of these parts such that if we now have a novel combination of uh, sensors, can we combine them together to, to execute this? And so one example of how this might look is if we have, in this case, a robot arm, it's picking up a little soda can and having to move it over to the target there. What if we change something about how the robot has to behave? So maybe instead of placing it on a shelf there, or sorry, placing it on a table there, it has to place it on a shelf. And so the idea is instead of retraining everything from end to end, what we really should just be doing is saying, well, use everything you've already learned and just instead of dropping the can there, place it on the shelf. So we're swapping out one little modular part of this. And we built a test bed to do this with, uh, with hundreds of tasks. And in this case, it's moving to a completely different robot arm with different, uh, uh, different dynamic uh, constraints and, uh, and properties. And so how can we just adapt just the pieces we need to handle these new tasks? Uh, we're also interested in open world learning. So if we learn a distribution for known classes, can we use this to detect something that's new and then automatically grow the representation over time to accommodate this? First off, detecting that it's new, that we haven't seen it before, and how to efficiently change it to reuse knowledge as best we can across these different tasks. Uh, we've taken all of these ideas and we're building a test bed for them using what we're calling a scavenger hunt with autonomous service robots. So this is a uh, video that was recorded a couple floors up from here in this building, where in this case, we have our mobile robot that's going around trying to find different objects. So in this case, it has to take a picture of a chair and a laptop, it takes photos of those, it uploads those to a website for, uh, for verification. And then the idea is, can we do this over a lifetime where we're learning how different objects look, their distributions of them in the environment, how to efficiently seek them and so forth. So the idea is to eventually build up to a very versatile set of tasks that you might expect like a personal assistant to be able to do, but do this with the robots. And so we're doing this in combination with, uh, with Peter Stone's group at UT Austin. This is a video of the same autonomous robot being deployed on a slightly different application. This was a demo that we did live during ICRA uh, 2022, just uh, a few months ago. And in this case, what the robot needs to do is to anticipate its environment. So this is uh, joint work with, with Costas Danilidis' group. And so what we have here is the robot has a limited set of observations over here of the world. But what it's trying to do is infer essentially everything else that it can't see based on occupancy anticipation. And so what you can see is over here, the robot is right here and there's a table and notice that it's filling in kind of free space behind the table because it's starting to learn how, what the extent of the environment is. And we're doing this in a lifelong learning context that as the robot gains more and more experience in an environment, it improves performance over time. The last set of applications I'm gonna talk about are to personalized medicine. Uh, so we've done some work in interpretable models. So these are models which are very easy to understand. And it's especially important for clinical applications where a clinician might need to look at it, figure out why a prediction was made, it might need to be explained to the patient or to an insurance company and such. And so you're very familiar probably with decision trees and things like boosting from standard machine learning classes. And what we've done is we've built up algorithms that kind of bridge between them. We've shown that these algorithms exist on a continuum. And by just changing one parameter, you can actually get a model that slides along this continuum and can balance between the two. So the idea is we're growing standard decision trees but we're doing this using advanced techniques from gradient boosting. And what the end result is, is a very interpretable model, but one that has performance that's roughly equivalent to what you would get from an ensemble technique, which is very, very high. And so here's some uh, examples of results we get from uh, radiant pneumonitis prediction uh, that was done in collaboration with radiology here. I wanna talk about two other projects, and these are all on developing 
lifelong medical assistance. And so the first is a project that's just starting up. We're calling it the Observer Project. It's led by Kevin Johnson. Um, and these are videos that we recorded just a few months ago of a standardized patient interaction in the, in the Penn Sim Center. And so what we're doing is we're looking at this problem if clinicians spend so much time documenting a visit, they spend hours going and typing up notes that are then going to people's charts. What if instead we could have the room just automatically perceive everything that was going on and automatically document this? And so what we're doing is we're gathering up a whole bunch of different multimodal data, everything from high quality video to 3D depth to infrared, and then using it to automatically generate documentation. The second set of problems is uh, collaboration with Daniel Hashimoto, who's happy to read right here. Give us a wave, Dan. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to develop a GPS-like uh, assistant for endoscopy, where what it can do, it can automatically figure out dissection planes in the environment, in, in, the, uh, in the limited view, and then improve performance as it experiences uh, different patients, different procedures, et cetera. So I just want to acknowledge all my uh, current and former PhD students who contributed to this and my postdocs. And if you're interested in joining us, we have a bunch of different open problems, open world ML, skill learning, interpretable medicine, and grounding natural language. Please join us. Uh, the link is here for applying and uh, also to our group's website. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Dinesh, and uh, I lead the perception, action, and learning group. All right. Um, and today I'll be talking about um, this umbrella of scaling vision-based robot learning, which unites several of the themes in our research group. All right. And so let me start by uh, kind of uh, stating kind of a goal that many of us share in, uh, in GRASP, which is to build robots that can operate in general purpose settings. Uh, and if you think about the settings in which robots have traditionally been successful, they've been kind of more controlled factory automation settings, but we'd like to eventually get robots to work in homes and offices and hospitals and workplaces and so on. And if you think about the differences between these settings, I like to think of what you have on the left as being fully observed and well-modeled, and the things that you have on the right as being more filled with uncertainties and unknowns. And therefore, perception is kind of key to being able to move towards this dream of um, general purpose autonomy, because perception involves extracting information, resolving uncertainty about the world, and so on. Right? Uh, here is kind of a, an instantiation in the driving setting. So what you have on the left, similar to what you had before, is a much more controlled setting that you have much more knowledge of, meaning an empty road here. And in settings like these, it's even possible for you to take one look at the road and then drive for many seconds at a stretch without uh, checking back in with the road, right? So without checking back in with the environment to see what's happening. Of course, this is not recommended, but you uh, theoretically you could do this, right? And uh, on the right, on the other hand, you have this really crowded road setting where you need to be checking back in with the environment at every instant very frequently just to make sure that you're keeping up with all the information that's being generated in this chaotic scene. And so I like to think about this through the formalism of um, uh, making more closed perception action loops. We want to try to make loops where uh, perception carries high throughput, low latency information from the environment to, to the, through to the uh, decision-making agent. And for this, uh, we like vision. Visual perception is a very convenient medium for capturing uh, really large amounts of information through a single sensor. And uh, control should eventually be able to take all of this really high amounts of information that's being delivered and map it to complex behaviors uh, for which we like learned controllers, especially in these kinds of settings where it's impossible to have good models of everything that's happening in the world. Uh, we find that these learned controllers are particularly useful. So um, that together basically motivates our kind of high level goal of building vision-based robot learning. A common critique of these approaches is that learning is experience intensive. You need to start from scratch for every new task that you have. You need to collect large amounts of experience, often tens of thousands, tens of millions sometimes, uh, uh, episodes, tens of millions of trials to learn every new task. And that's not quite scalable, right? So how can we actually improve this? Um, so what we've been focusing on uh, for the last couple of years is building algorithms that can abstract and attend to the right things in the world. And attention here or abstraction is uh, both in the sense of space, meaning attending to the right portions of a scene, but also temporally focusing on the right time instance uh, during a video feed and also focusing on the right snippets of past experience that best inform the task that you're currently trying to solve. And hopefully over the next few minutes, I'll be able to give you some flavor of each of these. So we like applying this abstraction enabled learning idea throughout the perception action loop. In particular, I like to break it down into uh, the movement of information from the world 
uh, down into images, which are sensed through observation, then into um, state information, which is a, a kind of a, a representation stage. How do you represent all the information in the scene? And then policy, which maps that state information through to actions that are then executed in the world. So we'll be uh, kind of uh, breaking down the stock into basically addressing each of these three uh, red arrows here. So let me start now with representation. So I'll give you a, a brief sense of uh, what we've been doing through uh, one recent project. So we've been working now for a long time on self-supervised representation learning, uh, particularly in the context of robotics. One thing that we've recently uh, kind of become excited about is this idea of multiple levels of description. A single scene does not always just require a single level of description. Many, many different levels of description varying in coarseness and fineness uh, can be produced for a single scene. This has not escaped the attention of computer vision researchers before. For example, in the context of pose estimation, the standard canonical representation of human pose would be to just represent the locations and uh, orientations of 17 joints on the person. But you can get a little more fine grained. You can double click, for example, on the face and then say the face itself has 60 degrees of freedom. And you can kind of try to capture that level of representation as well. But in the past, this kind of multiple levels of description has really been produced for individual domains by a manually defined kind of uh, process. Instead, we want to move to uh, automatically discovering these multiple levels of description uh, in a self-supervised fashion. And we recently have made some progress on this through this idea that we call key point pyramids. So uh, here is kind of how the system works. I won't really tell you how, uh, you know, uh, the, the technical details of it, but the system itself works in this fashion where you provide an unlabeled data set of images of a particular scene, and then you put it into an unsupervised learner that produces what we call a key point pyramid encoder. The aim is that eventually at test time, if you give it a, a new image as input, uh, you should be able to produce this kind of multi-level description. What I'm drawing here is, for example, um, one high level description key point attached to two lower level description finer key points. And so let's see some examples of what this works like in practice. Um, here is um, here are two people who are um, kind of uh, uh, moving around in, uh, in various ways to mime various actions. And you can see, for example, that one high level key point and two associated lower level key points are kind of attached to similar areas in both these people. We can also do this for other domains aside from people, which was the aim to start with, right? We wanted to be able to do this for arbitrary domains. So we collected a data set of objects in the lab being moved around on a tabletop. And sure enough, it works uh, quite nicely there as well. So this is automatic discovery of multi-level representations with this kind of key point abstraction. Let me move on to the second thing that I wanted to talk about, which is the policy. So recently we've had this idea of distilling policies from pre-recorded offline data in a particular way. People have been thinking for a long time about how you can produce new policies uh, without having to collect new experience for every new task. If we've collected some old experience before for other tasks, can we somehow use it again, right? And the most common way to do it by far is to use demonstrations. If somebody's shown you demonstrations, then can we just use those demonstrations? But the problem there is that in practice, you need to collect demonstrations for every new task. This is not very easy. Uh, instead, we want to use data that is not really task specific, data that we might have collected even for other tasks before. And the task specification itself comes in purely through providing some images of what the goal should look like. Right? So for example, if you want to lift an object, just provide an image of what the scene would look like when your robot has actually successfully lifted the object. And that's the setting that we call offline goal condition reinforcement learning. And uh, we've recently framed this as a very simple problem, which is uh, trying to minimize the KL divergence between the set of states that's induced by your policy that you're learning and the neighborhood of the goal image that you're providing as the task specification. And we find that this is um, a kind of a nice way to frame this problem but it doesn't unfortunately permit offline optimization because now you need to sample from dpi to minimize this uh, kl divergence and that's not possible if you're operating offline so it turns out that you can act actually massage this uh, mathematically you can go to the dual form of this uh, optimization problem and it works out that it actually is uh, it amounts to a kind of importance weighted imitation learning where you're automatically assigning importance weights to your pre-recorded data based on how relevant it is for your task. And there is a way to acquire those importance weights uh, denoted in this distribution automatically uh, based on the task that you're trying to solve. And it has really nice properties. It turns out to work well, much better than competing approaches in simulation, but also in the real world. And this is kind of something that we keep emphasizing in the group is we want to develop these learning methods, but we also want to eventually show proof on real robots. And so uh, it's quite nice that in this case, we were able to do that as well. 
Okay, and finally, for the last little bit, I'll talk about uh, this idea of uh, um, observation. So we have also been working for a long time on um, active methods for observation. How can we actually do active perception? This is not new to grasp. Uh, Rujina here is among the kind of progenitors of this field. And uh, recently we've had this idea that um, active observation does not have to be restricted only to observing the states. Instead, you can think about active observation also in the context of rewards for a reinforcement learning algorithm. And what I mean by this is that sometimes it's hard to perceive whether you've actually successfully completed the task. So as an example of this, if your task is to close a bottle cap, it's hard to perceive in this state whether you've actually successfully done this or not until you actually flip the bottle and then you can see that it's either loose or tight based on whether the water is leaking, right? And so you can do this for several other tasks, like for example, locking a door. It might not be obvious whether you've locked a door until you've actually tugged it. And so what we've done recently is we've trained these reward observation policies that interactively evaluate these task policies during learning. And um, we are able to train these reward observation policies, but more importantly, we're also able to use those observations of the reward then to train a task policy that's able to successfully learn these kinds of behaviors. I'm showing these for this one task of door locking, but we've also seen these in other tasks in other settings. Um, and in particular, again, in the real world, there is this screw tightening setting where again, it's hard to observe from a single image whether you've actually successfully tightened the screw, but by just tugging at the screw, you can tell whether you've done it uh, well or not. And it turns out that our approach, which we're calling LIRF, uh, does, does significantly better than the baselines here. Okay, I think I'm just about out of time. So I'll wrap up with a picture of some of us over the summer. Um, I know that a couple of my PhD students are looking to work with some new mentees. And if you're interested, you know, you should uh, definitely, definitely drop us a note. All right, thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Francis Shawande. I'm a second year mechanical engineering PhD student. I'm here today representing the Rehabilitation Robotics Lab. Uh, our lab is led by Dr. Michelle Johnson, and we bring together uh, people from a diverse set of fields, including medicine, neuroscience, mechanical engineering, bioengineering, computer, you know, just, again, a lot of different fields, all for the purpose of bridging the gap between engineering and rehabilitation. Our lab focuses on using robotic technologies for the purpose of assessing and providing therapy uh, for people with non-traumatic brain injuries, such as stroke and cerebral palsy. And we do so with an especially large emphasis on accessibility and affordability, because a lot of times the people who need this care the most, you know, there's uneven distribution of resources. So we want to make sure this is accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, we work with a variety of people um, locally, including uh, GRASP, CHOP, and Penn Medicine, as well as internationally in countries such as uh, Botswana and Mexico. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of our projects, but a common theme you're going to see here is that we uh, use a lot of in-house built robotic systems that are low cost and allow us to quantify sort of metrics used during therapy and rehabilitation, not to replace the job of a clinician or a therapist, but to alleviate the stress they have to go through. The first problem I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about is um, the TheraDrive, and the TheraDrive is a haptic, low cost, one degree freedom robotic arm. Uh, meant for, again, providing assessment and rehabilitation for people uh, with upper limb uh, motor impairments such as stroke and uh, people with HIV and stroke. Uh, the TheraDrive is capable of uh, a lot of different games to collect, collect a lot of different metrics, collect a lot of different metrics for people um, to make sure that the experience is not only low stress, like not stressful, but it's also interesting and engaging for them as well. And the TheraDrive has been uh, deployed locally in Philadelphia, but also abroad in Botswana because we're putting our money where our mouth is and we're saying that we really do care about employing these solutions uh, in areas where there aren't, there might not be as many resources for help. Some sort of sub-projects under TheraDrive are um, first the TheraDyad, which is two TheraDrive robotic arms working in tandem with each other. And they use, uh, they're connected haptically using sort of, you know, concepts and techniques from controls engineering. And we do so because we want to understand how people working together or working with the computer can help, their, help them improve and learn during these therapy sessions. Uh, next, we use uh, biosensing because a lot of the current methods for evaluating motor and cognitive impairment are subjective and can be slow. So using biosignals such as EMGs, IMUs, and ultrasounds, we're hoping to create or we're working to create uh, standardized robotic assessments that can, again, quantify 
and predict impairment. Next, I'm gonna talk about Biadler. And Biadler is uh, a set of two robotic arms for the purpose of helping people with bilateral impairment. Bilateral impairment refers to when somebody has one side or one arm that is more impaired than the other, which is a phenomenon we can see in stroke. And so the Biadler collects data from uh, the less impaired arm and uses that to inform how the more impaired arm can move. Lately, we're looking at this phenomenon called learned non-uses, which is where people who have, <clears throat> sorry, who have bilateral impairment, often uh, it, it happens that they overly rely on one side or one arm causing the performance of the second arm to deteriorate. So we're hoping to detect this phenomenon, uh, quantify how you know, severe it is and provide therapy to help alleviate it. Next, I'm gonna talk about the Panda Gym and the Panda Gym is a infant um, play gym meant to help us detect impairments such as cerebral palsy in infants between the age of one to six months. And you're gonna ask yourself, we're looking, why are we looking at babies so young who are basically just out of the womb? Well, this is because uh, impairments like cerebral palsy, it's been shown that motor therapy at an especially young age can be as like super effective just because infants have such high neuroplasticity and such a high capacity for learning. So we want to cast as soon as possible, but the current techniques for cap cap capturing or you know, judging impairment early on are subjective and inaccessible due to the fact that there's not enough clinicians performing these tasks. So the Panda Gym uh, has a set of modalities. We used to collect data, the first of which is cameras. The gym is outfitted with seven cameras that allow us to create a 3D reconstruction of the infant's pose, which we can analyze for you know, kinematic. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, we have seven cameras outfitted throughout the gym so we can uh, you know, have a 3D reconstruction of the infant's pose data. But also, as you can see in that bottom corner, we have the Panda toy, and this is a toy uh, meant to collect interaction data, see how much the infant's playing with it. It has sensors in it to see how hard it's squeezed or how hard it's hit, but it also has lights and noises to, you know, incur or encourage the infant to play with it. And finally, we have a pressure mat, and this collects a specific kind of data called center of pressure. And center of pressure through non-linear uh, non and linear dynamic analysis has been shown to be sensitive to uh, detecting impairment. The Pandagen project also has a couple of sub-projects. First, first of which is the infant sentiment analysis. And the infant sentiment analysis is using computer vision to analyze the, you know, the infant's face to, to judge their emotions, to see how their emotions inform their movements uh, kinematically. Uh, next, we have the Lossy sensor, which is a novel soft sensor um, built using lattice structures and fiber optics. And it's meant to be an adaptable sensor, uh, but which is again, also so soft, so it's gonna be adapted to things like the Panda toy. And we even have it, you know, we're working on impl implementing it in the TheraDrive project as well. And finally, the, there's the Infant Simulator, which is my project. And uh, this is us building a robotic model of a baby for the purpose of understanding how infant motion affects their center of pressure. And we're doing so because we're working towards this goal of having a computer vision system that can predict center of pressure because a phone is more common and more accessible than a pressure mat, which is wonky and can only tend to find in hospitals. The final project I'm gonna talk about today is Flow. And Flow is a combination of a social and a telepresence robot. Um, one reason for inaccessibility in therapy is tends to be just physical uh, you know, distance and accessibility. Some people can't get to the hospital and sometimes the therapist can't get to them. So a telepresence robots help bridge, bridge this physical gap. But additionally, flow is capable of showing a wide range of emotions and has dexterous arms, all allowing it to be expressive. Um, flow can play games with the patients, not again, not, not only allowing them to have a sort of engaging experience, but still allowing it to like different data metrics. It can play Simon Says and based on how the uh, which can which can it uses as a, a form of therapy. Uh, Flow is also outfitted with cameras for the purpose of collecting data um, and allowing us to again quantify the things that we're seeing so that again allevi alleviating stress from the therapist. Uh, Flow has been implemented in the community uh, along with people of a wide range of ages from children to you know the elderly but and um, it's been shown to be successful and going forward we're hoping to see how much more automated automation we can put into flow and focusing on a specific uh, set of people, uh, which is people with stroke. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And feel free to contact anybody you see here. 
All right. Um, so my name is Michael Poza. I'm uh, an assistant professor here in mechanical engineering, also with some secondary in, in the ESC and, and CIS. Um, and I run the Dynamic Autonomy and Intelligent Robotics Lab, which you call DARE. Um, and, and so this sort of kind of gives you some idea of the type of problem we've been thinking about lately. Um, imagine that your robot uh, enters some environment uh, and it's a novel environment. It's one it's not seen before. So maybe it's uh, some kitchen with a bunch, of, a bunch of junk in it or maybe some other uh, uh, you know, uh, work setting or, or uh, outdoor environment. Um, and in some reasonable time frame, okay, in this novel environment, the robot's gonna have to um, understand something about its environment and then it's gonna have to select and execute actions okay, to achieve some desired task, whether it's cooking or cleaning or uh, you know, using tools. And the focus in a lot of our work that I'll, I'll mention today is on doing so quickly, okay? So we don't have um, years of compute uh, to go run a simulation because we don't know the model ahead of time. Uh, we can't spend you know, five days uh, executing actions in this environment to learn. We really have a few seconds or minutes, right? So everything has to, to operate uh, with the minimal amounts of experiential data. Um, and so what could go wrong in this setting just to kind of give you some idea, right? Well, for one, you know, the types of things we're gonna encounter and they have very complicated geometries. Uh, maybe they have internal degrees of freedom that have to be uncovered uh, like these tongs. Uh, maybe they have kind of strange surface properties or, or, or physical properties. So maybe they're deformable, maybe you can cut them. Uh, 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 you know, uh, maybe they have, you know, a hard side of the cheese and then soft underneath the skin. Okay, um, and you know, if you think about the kind of tasks that people are able to accomplish, this is sort of an extreme example here, but the degree of interaction between a human and its environment um, is, is extreme and is rapid, right? There's, uh, you're touching everything, everything's moving around very, very quickly, uh, particularly when there's lots of objects involved at a time. Um, so we work on a few different things in, in the lab. Uh, and uh, I'll kind of touch on some of the highlights lately. So one of the things we do in our lab is we work on like a locomotion. Okay, so we have a uh, Cassie biped, you'll see the, the robot in, uh, uh, downstairs in town across the hall from the machine shop. Uh, and we're doing all sorts of different things. This is work by uh, three PhD students right now, Brian, Yuming, and Will in particular, um, and working on running, walking, jumping, um, you know, working on box jumping soon enough, uh, that's uh, on, on the near-term horizon. Um, and there's a lot of different projects here that all kind of focus on uh, how we use some kind of model-based control for like a locomotion. So we're thinking about when you jump and you land, um, there's this big impact event. Uh, how should you design a control policy so that it's gonna be robust to slamming into the ground uh, on that large landing? Um, how should we think about, um, you know, deciding where to place footsteps, particularly on rough terrain um, and, and so on. So lots of ongoing work here on Cassia. We're working right now on integrating some vision into our planning, our planning step. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of our, our focus lately is on making decisions quickly. And so one of the, the, the recent projects we've been working on, uh, this was actually uh, nominated for an award at ICRA this year uh, from, from ALP was on real-time control. So at real-time rates, and we're talking like 30 to 100 Hertz here, we wanna be making planning decisions about what to touch and where to touch it and when to touch it. So this is a hybrid planning problem. It's a hybrid MPC problem. It's completely intractable if you try to solve this uh, with kind of traditional hybrid methods, just because the number of modes is way too extreme. Um, and so Alp came up with this nice algorithm that, that kind of leverages some understanding of the non-smooth dynamics in combination with an, with an ADMM um, uh, underpinning. Uh, and we're doing things like getting this cart pulled to balance, even as it slams into these walls at high speeds, uh, as well as there's most recently doing this on Franca, where it's rolling a ball around, uh, all just running an NPC planner uh, online. Um, other focus of the lab right now is on, on learning. Uh, but as I mentioned before, very explicitly on data efficient uh, uh, experiential learning. So one of the problems we, we sort of started with was, well, you know, if I collect, let's say a few seconds or a few minutes of data, can I learn a predictive model right, for, for these sort of contact rich tasks? Um, and if you just kind of naively collect some data and you fit a deep neural network to it and you say, go make predictions, it just fails miserably at this problem, okay? The, 
the stiffness of watching this cube bounce and roll. So observing the cube move, trying to make predictions. The fact that it slams into the ground and slides and rolls and tumbles is completely lost on, a, on any different learning framework. Um, and you know, even for you know, large volume data, um, it, it just produces kind of nonsensical results, right? Uh, it might get the overall bulk motion of the cube correct, but it's gonna float through the ground. It's gonna come to rest balancing on a corner or if it comes to rest at all. Um, and so what we found instead is that if we, um, again, leverage our understanding of physics here. So uh, particularly the non-smooth physics and we uh, embed that into an implicit learning framework, uh, we can essentially learn motion and geometry at the same time. So again, just watching stuff move, we can say because it moved this way, because it tumbled and rolled this way, it actually must have had a certain shape. Uh, and the other dynamical properties you know, are learnable as well. And so we actually can fit a deep network again here to geometry, but do this with about a couple minutes of data, right? Uh, if we use even simpler representations, we can take 10 seconds of data and identify that actually must have been a cube. We know it's friction. We can make really good high accuracy prediction rollouts. Um, so very excited by this. We're working on getting, you know, getting rid of the, the motion capture here. Use, you know, stable tags. We're getting rid of the cube limitation here. Uh, so doing more interesting objects and more robot object interaction. Um, and then I'll mention one other uh, kind of recent thrust in the lab. Um, you know, cubes are great, and, and rolling, touching, touching simple objects is great. But you know, how do we get to more complicated uh, domains? And one of the big things that you need if you want to do control for a complicated system is you need some simpler representation under the hood. Okay, so if you want to do real-time control, you know, I could say we can do real-time MPC through contact, but we're not talking 40 degrees of freedom and you know, 20 contacts for grasping an object and walking around, right? That's totally, totally impossible. So we need some kind of simpler underlying representation. Um, and often those come from you know, our intuition, right? Our robot looks like a pendulum, right? That's a common, common version here. And so we've been asking the question is, can we uncover these things automatically? Can I write down an optimization problem or a learning problem that says, really, if I wanna do some, you know, in-hand manipulation task or some locomotion task, really, there's some simpler representation that would be useful. And I'm gonna to try to uncover that uh, uh, in this case in simulation. And so, that enables us to do things like uncover uh, simple models for like a locomotion. Uh, and even more recently, do this for manipulation where uh, we can, you know, relatively simple problem, but here using a three-fingered robot to uh, manipulate a cube. And this is learned from scratch uh, with no prior in about two minutes uh, of data. So all in simulation right now, but uh, we're working on putting this in the real world again. Again, so the focus, right, is on, on doing this all very quickly. Um, okay. And then, uh, you know, this is a, a lab photo from, from last year. Um, we're always looking for students to, to help on and, and work on different projects. Um, and so feel free to reach out to me. And I think I have a couple of minutes for questions, yeah? So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much. Yeah. It only, it's right, it only works for convex objects. So one, one part of that comes from how we represent the object right now. We have a representation that's limited to convex objects. But also, if you have non-convex objects, they actually have to, if you want to cover their geometry from interaction, they have to interact with other non-convex objects, right? Because a non-convex object, the concavities will never touch the table, uh, you know, if it's interacting with the table. So um, our thought right now is probably just use combinations of convex shapes. So if you have one uh, as a, the simpler way to do that. Yeah. It can handle curves? Yes, it can handle curves. We've not done a curved object, but um, the only problem with a, like a ball, for instance, if you throw a ball, it's gonna roll away. Um, so you'd have to have something that, that kind of stops eventually or, or yeah, something for it to, to bump into. Okay, so you guys can see it. Okay, great. So yeah, my name is John Bushi. I'm a faculty in CIS. So I'm very happy to give a talk today. Uh, so for many years, I've been interested in robotics, but I was always a little afraid to get into. So this is my little entry to robotics. Uh, the topic I'm focused on for the last several years has been uh, fo uh, on the topic of first-person video. Uh, that is a camera on you looking out to the world. 
And what I'm trying to do uh, over the years is trying to make the computer to understand what are you thinking. So not necessarily looking what's out there, which is the typical task of the computer vision, but trying to look into your mind and see what you're thinking. So that's the task we're trying to get to. And for that, uh, we've been constructing this uh, escape room where we instrument the person with a first person camera, uh, gaze tracking, and also camera looking at you from outside in. So this is actually a data set uh, we are collecting right now. So it's not escape room, but the uh, violin playing or guitar playing or piano playing. So anybody out there who would like to participate in this uh, data collection, please contact us. So what we should do is we're gonna put the camera on you so you can see a GoPro on your head. Uh, we might put the eye tracking, uh, eye gaze tracking glasses on it as well. Uh, there'll be three cameras looking at you from the surround. Uh, so what we call Eagle and Exo. So that's a term that we, we use. And from this exercise, what we want to do is to be able to uh, do two things. So one thing is we want to be able to do the sort of translation between the views. So that would be the sort of the holy grail we would see. Imagine you can see a player playing from the third person, like say you find somebody playing on YouTube and you put the goggle on, you can see it from your first person perspective. You can see his or his, her hands on your violin playing. So that would be one task we want to do. The second thing we want to do is we want to figure out how to measure the scale level of the player. So we're really interested in the sort of detail levels of the finger movements and so on, but also your mental planning ahead uh, where you pay attention to and so on. So, so this is a data collection we are doing right now. We have guitars. Uh, not too bad the sound's not playing, but the John is a great player. So this is the way it looks like. Uh, you can see the hand for the first person. Uh, you can see from a different perspective. So the viewpoint change is pretty dramatic. So typical uh, view changes, uh, synthesis are not gonna work. So we had to invent new tools to solve this problem. Uh, so this is a violin plane. I guess a very different view from two different perspectives, first person from the top left. Uh, you can almost feel the tension of the player, right? The, the places where she is gonna you know, struggle a little bit or uh, feeling very emotional. From the third person perspective, it's not as dramatic, uh, but you still can see a lot more of the body uh, overall. So what we want to do is trying to translate between the views. Uh, so back up a little bit, uh, the first person, uh, Research is really about three things to me. The one is about attention. Basically, from the first person, you can really feel the attention of the people, right? So you can tell what they are focusing on. The second is a prediction. We can learn from the first person uh, what he or she is going to do in the future. So instead of you have a robot planner, so my strategy is just do a table lookup. Just see what he's seen before and see what he's done before. So use that as a prediction for the future. The last one is the skill and the control. And that is something that we are really working on, try to figure out how people make decisions. Uh, in a different scenario, what did they remember, uh, what caused them to make certain actions. So this is a video of uh, footage we found on the internet. This is a, a, a dog cam, it's not a human, so we don't have a ground truth on this dog, what they pay attention to, but we, we conjecture that the dog had the same, uh, similar social behavior as a human. So what we want to do is infer uh, from the first person dog cam, what the dog is paying attention to. So people and humans so on. So the training data has come from human data, but we applied to the dog. It seemed to work reasonably well. Uh, we also tried to learn how to navigate in space by essentially retrieval of the past memory. So on the left, we have a human walking in the space. Uh, this is a, not a self-driving task, but a self-walking task. Um, I mean, imagine you have a dog running on the streets, a robot dog, you need this kind of capacity. So again, what we're doing is simply uh, remember what we had done in the past on a video on the left is a video of the past, uh, so 15 seconds ago. And on the trajectory is basically the path that you walk, in, you walk into the picture, into the future. So it's a learning from the ghost view into the future. And the right is basically a retrieve or a recovered trajectory from the past. As you can see, my students tend to jaywalk a lot in Philadelphia. So he tend to cut across cars in between the cars. He learns that. It learns also you can go into somebody's home and so on. For outdoors is relatively straightforward. Indoors is a lot more complicated. There are escalators, uh, which are usually hidden. You cannot see very well. Uh, but here we also learned uh, from the human behavior pass that you can you know, walk into the stores or you can find the escalator. Uh, so navigation has a fundamental is really is about just finding the exits really. So from the view, where do you find the way to go out? Uh, the second pass of uh, you know where to walk and walk about so, so on is a little bit easier. So here's a scale control task. Uh, so imagine you're learning how to do mountain biking uh, by watching videos. Uh, 
so this is a, a task where you're not computing what's in the picture because it's not really the point here. What's in point here is you try to learn how you actually handle the bike, right? Are you braking, which is the red dots in the middle? Are you accelerating, uh, pedaling, uh, which is the green dots? And uh, the blue arrow indicating the, you know, the handlebar motions. Uh, on the top left, we have the complete estimate of speed and air drag and so on, all obtained from the video footage itself. The key of all this is really just gravity estimation uh, because all sports is really just fighting with gravity. Um, so here we actually learn the gravity found images without using any other sensors. So back to escape room, this is uh, what we have started. Uh, this is an ongoing effort, uh, which I'm really, really excited about. So this is actually too bad the videos uh, doesn't come with audio, but we have an escape room. We have people trying to find things uh, obviously, uh, stuff shouldn't be in a microwave like this, but uh, you'll find clues and that will help you to find uh, the puzzle. Yeah. Yes, this is the first person view. Yeah, this is the first person doing a, a, a escape room puzzle solving. So, yeah, you can see uh, he or she is looking for clues. So, uh, looking for, uh, you know, essentially clues that can piece together. Uh, some of the clues actually uh, are hard because some of the clues are decoys in the sense it's wrong. <laughs> you have to infer some of those wrong clues, uh, which is a little bit tricky. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a decision process. It's a, it's a memory task because you have to remember what have you seen. Uh, sometimes when you look at something, you don't know that it's important. Uh, so you have to kind of, when you saw the clue, you say, oh, I know where that is. So if, if you don't remember, you have to go find it, that might be slower. Um, so we, we have, uh, you know, cameras both in, inside out, which is the first person on the middle. We also have outside looking in, which give you the sort of surround view of it. Uh, combining the two cameras together, we are able to uh, estimate the entire 3D room uh, just from the GoPro camera itself. Uh, that is something you learn by 80, uh, but initially teaching. Uh, and you estimate the camera pose, uh, which is shown here in blue. Um, with a eye gaze tracking device, we also also know exactly where you're looking at uh, and what time. So those are the, all the points uh, that we've been examined on the table of the objects. Uh, we have on a bigger space, um, this is on the couch. Uh, we also can, uh, with combination of camera views, we can pull ourselves outside of body. So this is a first person view fused with the third person view together. Uh, so you can see a hand in front of you moving in 3D space. It's like a ghost. Um, um, so we have a complete understanding of this from multiple view angles. Uh, so here's a video I will play. Uh, so on the top left, you see a first person view, which is uh, de detecting the objects and hands. And that object is then fused to the outside view. Uh, we also see the prism, which is indicating the head camera as well as the gaze tracking camera. Uh, the middle is the gaze itself. You can see what the first person gaze looks like. Below is the 3D death map. We know how far it is. On the right is the detection of hands and objects and so on. So from those, what we were trying to figure out uh, how humans uh, are able to make decisions as well as trying to figure out what they are uh, remembering as they move in space. Um, we'll dive in a little bit details. We have very detailed hand object interactions. We have segmentation of the hands. We have the contact points of the hands with objects. Uh, we also try to infer the 3D hand pose. Uh, this is the final video on the show, which is uh, for my students, Lin Zhi, who has uh, decided to go one step beyond, which shows you can detect the hands, also remove it. So create this called a Sisu video. Which I found this very interesting. So whatever the power of the first person video is, the hands always kind of including everything. So now actually not only detecting it, we actually can take that out. That's it. <laughs>